Okay, first low friction news of the day is a uh, good number of inquiries through the week on Silka's new chain stripper. So this is really a sort of a, I guess, a direct competitor to Ceramic Speed's UFO drivetrain clean. Uh, so how do they fit into your low friction world? Basically, um, you know, in a lot of areas, a lot of countries around the world these days, so it's, a, it's an inquiry that we get fairly frequently is, uh, you know, people trying to prep their chain for, you know, either waxing or a top drip lubricant. Um, that it can be quite difficult uh, to get hold of your sort of more traditional solvents such as your mineral turpentine or white spirits followed by your um, methylated spirits or denatured alcohol. Uh, so yes, you can use degreases as well. Some degreases do carry risk of um, or possible risk of hydrogen embrittlement, things like that. So on the one side, I guess it makes it easy because they're super concentrated. They make the job of cleaning the chain or stripping the chain of that factory grease quite easy um, and the other thing that they I guess the other option they really bring which is great is that because they're so concentrated you know using a degreaser or mineral turpentine or white spirits for an on bike clean you know it does okay but it's really difficult to get a perfect clean of the factory grease because factory grease is pretty stubborn and definitely right deep inside the chain I mean your your solvent is kind of running out um, you know, before it's really had the time to break down that factory grease to get it out. You just need to sort of keep pumping it and pumping it through. I mean, a perfect off-bike clean, you know, really is if we take a sort of most factory grease chains, it's going to be sort of three bars of around sort of 200, 250 mil of mineral turpentine, followed by a couple of bars of methylated spirits to ensure there's no film left behind from the cleaning. You know, it's really tough to match that doing it on the bike it's just yeah, that would be a mess to, you put 100 mil through and it's you know, you've got a mess on the floor so these being really super concentrated so you need really very little product to actually properly dissolve the factory grease and then leave behind their special film that they have to help enable the wax to bond means that for those who are not planning to do immersive waxing they just wanted to clean their chain properly uh, you know for a top drip lubricant then doing that very well on bike is an option with these products that you just really are going to struggle to achieve with your more traditional solvents so that side is great and whilst they are expensive typically because they're so you know concentrated you're going to get many 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 chains uh, clean from you know a one liter bottle of these products as opposed to you know you're, you're going to get basically like a chain cleaned pretty much from one liter of solvent uh, using your traditional solvents or degreases so so you kind of get what you pay for, and in in a bunch of countries, like in terms of actual net cost to prep a chain, whilst these are a lot more expensive, they actually work out basically the same or cheaper on balance because so little is needed um, to prep a chain using one of these products as opposed to the more traditional path. So that side is all, uh, yeah, I guess really good. The more options that come out like this, um, yeah, it just makes it easier for people to get onto a great path. Uh, I really like this little bundle pack. <clears throat> I think that's going to be great. So already, so more and more people who go the immersive waxing path are purchasing products like Silka SS Drip or UFO Drip or True Tension Tungsten All Weather that you can use in conjunction with your immersive waxing, um, especially for off-road riders. It makes it like it's a whole lot easier because of the harsh conditions you tend to need to re-wax more frequently than road riders do. And you know, just that sort of re-wax anxieties uh, so to speak so wor worrying about whether or not they're going to be able to keep up with re-waxing their chain every time they need to re-lube their chain using um, something like SS Drip or UFO or True Tension for say the next five re-lubes as normal and then just do a re-wax to reset any contamination that has started to build there's no easier way to uh, do chain maintenance than just re-wax a chain to reset contamination you know, that path has been really popular and, you know, I guess growing ever more and more popular as, sorry, this decided to barge in, uh, you know, as more and more people in the off-road world start to consider what a low friction, low cost, uh, lovely drivetrain would be like. So having that in a pack, so already we sell a lot of SS drip with wax orders. Um, and I think that having the cleaner in there to prep as well it's just going to be an extra win. Um, I think UFO should probably follow Silka's lead and have a little bottle um, with their UFO drip as opposed to just a big bottle that, 
you know, do you want to spend all that extra money on an, I guess, what's an expensive cleaner that's probably going to last you five to ten years of chain prep, you know, or do you just want the bottle that's going to take care of the, the chain that you're dealing with right now to get you going for the next very long time? One thing just to take note, though, with um, all these cleaners, or I guess the ones that have been coming out lately, making uh, great claims with regards to the environmental credentials, um, and that, I guess, regarding the product themselves is not in doubt or in question by me. So when products, um, you know, from Silker, um, you know, say, for instance, claim to be direct release, which means that they're so environmentally friendly, despite being a super powerful solvent, so that's pretty cool. Uh, it means you can pour it down the drain and all is well. Just factor in because they do mention on, I guess, the video launch of the chain stripper that basically, you know, you can uh, prep the chain on the bike and wash it down, uh, you know, your driveway. So, to, you know, I mean, yes, you can, but the only, I guess, issue I have with that is that, you know, if what you're cleaning off with the environmentally friendly cleaner, if that is not also direct release, then you shouldn't direct release it out into the environment. Um, to my knowledge, factory greases were not direct release it's not really something that you would want um, you know out into the waterways so if you're cleaning a hundred percent environmentally you know friendly credentialed lubricant off your chain with one of these products and it is also direct release you know rated if you've got both parts of the equation uh, in super environmentally friendly and direct release sweet if only one part of the equation is direct release and the other part is not when you mix them together that equals a not so yeah for me cleaning factory grease off um, if you're doing that you know that shouldn't be going out into the environment you would still want to try to contain that and dispose of that properly so just take note of that uh, there's a lot of degreases in a lot of i guess areas not just cycling that claim to be wonderfully environmentally friendly and that it can just be sort of tipped out uh, into the waterways or down your drain however yeah just take note that obviously if what you're cleaning is not you should not do that all right <clears throat> next we have campagnolo's launch of their new wireless uh, 12 speed group set and specifically focused i guess for zero friction cycling's perspective is you know the move to the 10 tooth cog uh, and the cassette so uh, you may have already listened to i guess there's been a couple of sort of interesting opinion takes on this move already by uh, Jesse Coyle on uh, Chris Miller Cycling and also Peak Talk uh, have a great um, sort of, I guess, balan balancing perspective on that. Um, my perspective is probably going to be um, a bit harsher than both. So uh, Jesse was really of the opinion that the 10 tooth cog, you know, gets a lot of hate um, and that's a bit unfair. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of, I guess, sort of not great vibes towards 10 tooth uh, from you know really anybody focused on low friction and efficiency for a fair while so really ever since SRAM made that move um, with axis 12 speed for road um, but as peak talk explains and i'm going to try to i guess just expand on this the issue is not so much the 10 tooth cog itself because you don't spend a lot of time of your cycling in that small gear the issue is the smaller chain rings that accompany the move with a 10 tooth cog. Okay, so I have covered it in one of my rambling long videos in the past, but you know, basically what occurs, you've got three things that go against you once you sort of make that move. Now, you know, a 10 tooth, an off-road uh, for mountain bike, brilliant. For road, personally I find it disappointing. I was really happy when Campy did not follow SRAM that path when they first went to 12 speed. And same obviously with Shimano. Thankfully Shimano tend to be pretty switched on with regards to drives to train efficiency. Um, so, all right, what you've got counting against you is the obvious one is you have greater articulation around the chain ring. So you've got some increased losses in your chain from that. Compounding that though is the smaller the chain ring, the greater the chain tension you have or the greater the load on the top span of the chain for a given pedaling wattage. You're pedaling, uh, if you're doing 300 watts at 90 cadence with 175 mil crank arm, the load that that is putting into the chain or the tension in the chain is greater in a smaller ring as opposed to a larger ring. So there's a double up there. So when you go to a larger ring, you not only get less articulation at the chain ring, but those articulations are occurring under lesser chain tension. There's less 
mechanical leverage you know force of the crank arm over the chain ring the larger it is that's why you get much higher tension loads in mountain bike chain rings that are small and obviously in your small chain ring so you've got a double up there the other part is that for a given gear inches because of the smaller chain rings at the front you will be in a smaller cog at the rear for you know that that given gear ratio that you are after so three things kind of combine to make a tangible difference now i'm going to go through just a fun little demonstration as to whether or not um, you know it does make a difference to you because on the one hand you know jesse coyle is right most people are not going to you know ever notice or need the you know slightly improved efficiency of the larger chain rings as opposed to the move to the smaller 10 tooth cog and thus the smaller chain rings that accompany that move uh, you will not be able to detect the difference in friction in your riding we're just not that sensitive an instrument even in extremely precise you know timed uh, climbs or going chung method you're going to be very I guess it, it's a small change to detect it could be done if you're doing chung really well however you know he's correct um, basically cyclists you will not notice if, if someone was to put uh, a set of 53 39s on and then swap that to a 48 32 um, and ask you if you can pick which one is which and you're not allowed to look you will not be able to detect but does it make a difference should you worry about it uh, let's do a fun example just uh, something different on this uh, fun Friday afternoon and see if this has it I guess a different perspective on things ah, my apologies before I dash to the quick demonstration uh, let me just take you through some I guess tested differences uh, apologies for the quality of the graph as well this is um, taken from uh, I believe it was Velo News a test that Jason Smith of um, Friction Facts uh, did a few years ago uh, when one by well, I guess when SRAM made the move to the um, smaller uh, chain ring size and also uh, just testing one by versus two by what this test shows I guess so if we have a look at the extreme end here um, so we've got a 5311 versus 4810 basically the same gear ratio but there is pretty much a six watt difference so whilst yes you don't spend a lot of time in your top gear uh, when you are there there's there is a bit more difference to be had up at that uh, that higher end in your more normal riding gear so let's compare say a 48 uh, 19 cog sorry my mouse is not working my computer is not really working um, so 48 19 versus say 53 19 we've got pretty much around a sort of two and a half three watt uh, gap there so sure you don't spend a lot of time in your top gear getting the maximum uh, losses of the 10 tooth cog but for all of your riding you know in the smaller with the smaller chain rings you are going to carry an efficiency loss penalty as opposed to in the larger chain rings uh, there are some caveats uh, when that may not occur but that is going to be the case you know, the vast majority of the time the smaller chain rings are going to you know it's for road they're going to give you greater losses as opposed to running I guess the chain ring sizes that we're sort of more accustomed to which is your you know your 5339 and your 5236 so it's not I guess the height of the 10 tooth because sure we don't spend a lot of time in the 10 tooth it is really the height from my side of small chain rings that accompany move to the 10 tooth that's the killer that's where you're getting you know greater losses They're probably averaging around two watts most of the time in pretty much all of your riding gears and for new fang dangle group sets that cost in this case about eight thousand uh, dollars you know my belief is that things should be moving forwards in all aspects they shouldn't be moving forward in some and yet you know in 2023 going backwards in terms of drivetrain efficiency it's why why are we stepping backwards um, it should be being improved so I really disagree with the move to a 10 tooth cog and smaller chain rings and now I'll move to the little demo you can decide for yourself uh, hopefully from this perspective as to whether or not it is going to mean anything to you or not all right just for fun <clears throat> something different I'm going to I guess put into maybe some perspective that might help um, with extra losses by going to smaller chain rings 
which is the way or the path that is walked when road group sets introduce a 10 tooth cog. Uh, we're going to try to put that in perspective with just some uh, crank spins. So here we go. Here is just my hard working oldest uh, mountain bike. Does a lot of uh, winter work and the, you know, if a race is really wet. So uh, things are a bit hammered on this moment. The BB's a bit hammered. So we'll just do a quick free spin. Just uh, bear with me, it'll make sense uh, as we get just uh, another couple of minutes in. All right, here we go. Okay, so it spins. Gets an okay number of free spins. It's a BB, uh, it's going okay considering how uh, hammered it is. So, you know, this is probably somewhere around about a half a watt loss bottom bracket. Okay, and now I've just, really just way over tighten the preload. So it's got a lot of preload set in, which will introduce a lot more friction into the bearings. So now I do a free spin, not amazing. So now being not a, you know, the, the crank's not uh, loaded under pedaling load, the reality is I now probably have somewhere around a two and a half watt bottom bracket loss due to the uh, increased preload that I've introduced as opposed to before it would have been, you know, a typical sort of BB, say somewhere around a half watt loss. So we've got a couple of watts more losses in there. Now I assure you that, say a solid 99% plus of cyclists, if they were to pop their chain off doing some general checks and maintenance, and they checked their crank and it felt like this and did that, they would take some action to reduce the friction losses, you know, they would be Inspecting the bearings, uh, probably, you know, at minimum, um, doing a full sort of clean and re-grease. Most likely, if it was like this, if it had just naturally gone like this, then they would be getting some new bearings. Or it could be that, you know, if it's been recently serviced, it might be that someone has cranked up the preload uh, way too much, which, which happens sometimes. Either way, no one is going to really see their BB like that and go, yeah, that's cool. They're going to take action. They're not going to be happy riding around with the extra losses. And yet, you know, in reality, we're talking that sort of same two watts as to what we're, you know, I guess, going to see quite easily introduced with drivetrain efficiency losses with one system versus another. Alrighty, that'll do. Sorry, jumped around all over the place a little bit there and uh, don't have time to do any uh, takes, uh, one take wonder this afternoon as I try to pump this out. So yeah, um, I hope you found that, um, I guess, a couple of interesting uh, extra points or takes on those uh, two little topics there that uh, may not have sort of been prevalent in some other media that you've uh, listened to or read. Uh, if you enjoyed, I'm supposed to remind you, obviously, to like and subscribe the vids and share them with your friends if you can uh, so that we uh, yeah, keep working our way up. Uh, we're getting close to 10,000, which... Again, for a strange, boring old man talking about uh, chain lubrication, um, uh, I'm happy with that. Thank you, everybody. So see if we can get past 10,000 soon. And yeah, overall, uh, have a great weekend, and I will try to get uh, the next update out on the next low friction topic, um, hopefully next Friday if I can. All right, thanks, everyone. Bye. All right, so does two watts matter, uh, or three watts, or four watts, or six watts depending on what gear you're in i mean objectively for the vast majority of cyclists no it's not going to make any difference uh, and you will not be able to detect it <clears throat> however as the old famous saying going half this game's 90 percent mental do you want something that is factually and thanks to the laws of physics less efficient than another system the previous system even that they just you know have been running with um, should things be stepping backwards with regards to efficiency despite other technology areas moving forwards you know my answer to that obviously is pretty clearly a no um, you know if Campy really wanted to make uh, a strong push back into the world to a peloton they are sure as shit not going to do it with some 50 34 or 48 32 chain rings um, just like when SRAM brought out, uh, you know, the move to the 10 tooth and their uh, 4832s, and the uh, they had the 4630s, which is still you know prevalent out there. The first thing that the World Tour teams demanded that were SRAM sponsored were a set of 5438 rings, and they basically locked out the 10 tooth. So they just went back to exactly where they were before, 
with 11 speed, despite this being the new flashbang uh, you know, 12 speed. So, you know, Campy would have to do a similar thing. If they want to get into the Pro uh, Peloton properly, then the first thing they would need to do would be to make some 54 uh, 38 rings. <clears throat> and no one's really going to ever need to use the 10 tooth. So, you know, is that the right path? Is that the right direction? Because at the end of the day, most recreational cyclists who race or who like to ride fast with their group ride or just want, I guess, what is most efficient for them. Uh, just not taking a loss for no reason, really, or no reason for them, at least, anyway. Um, you know, they're going to want the larger chain rings. I would bet if Camp Agnolo uh, released a 5438 set of chain rings or 5236s, they would, that option would sell just hand over fist over the something like a 4832 or even the 5034s. So would SRAMs, if SRAMs didn't make their 5438 chain set approximately $50,000. Um, so yeah, it is just a backwards ass move. Um, and sure, you won't detect it, but mentally it's there. Um, you know, I'm not gonna come, uh, nor should others be coming along and making a change to your bike uh, to introduce a couple of watts of extra friction somewhere in it. The group set manufacturers with their latest and greatest group sets shouldn't be doing that either. So, yeah, hopefully you can tell uh, very much against it. And yeah, the enemy is not so much, uh, as I explained before, the 10 tooth, it's the smaller rings. Um, and and again, uh, one of the um, the points that uh, was a great point by Peak Talk, whilst I remember is that, you know, especially the, I guess, the, um, the crowd that are going to be looking into time trials. So, Again, those small rings just don't cut it. Um, a friend of mine is looking at a new time trial bike. Really like the look of the Factor Hanzo. Uh, however, the only builds come with uh, the SRAM Axis, um, so which is great for building up a TT bike due to the wireless. But uh, you know, 4832 chain set on a time trial bike. Um, you know, just no one wants that. So you know, it, it is just especially for that type of riding, as opposed to running say a 5438. You're just giving up. You know, another chain's worth of efficiency most of the time. You might as well run two chains on there. So, yeah, really, I hope uh, that this trend d does not, I guess, expand across to Shimano. Again, thankfully so far, Shimano have always tended to be very, uh, I guess, well focused on drivetrain efficiency. Um, I would shudder to think that in the future that they're going to go to a 10 tooth and smaller chain rings. So why do they do it? I mean, it has been sort of fairly well covered. So it is a cost saving for them to make the smaller chain rings and overall smaller number of uh, you know, teeth count, especially with a 12 tooth uh, cassette, sorry, 12 tooth, 12 cog cassette. Uh, the machining costs add up. Uh, so they are trying to save some costs uh, with the machining for doing that. You would be right in thinking that they're hardly passing those costs on to you. So uh, it's a cost saving for them uh, it is no benefit at all for you. We should be having, uh, as general, back really to the older uh, days, or say not even that long ago, 54, uh, sorry, 5034 uh, compact. Your 5236 is pretty much, uh, you know, suits a lot of the, the cycling demographic and is just a general great uh, combination. 5438 stepping up to the sort of some of the faster, more powerful racing scenes. So, that's where we're at on that. Um, there's a whole lot of other commentary, obviously, around uh, various things with the Campy uh, launch, um, you know, and and certainly price is one of them. I'd really like to see, actually, while I'm here, while I remember, I know, sorry, I ramble, but Campy, they do drive me a little bit nuts, aside from this move. But this move has been the catalyst to finally sort of cover this tiny little uh, little fun topic uh, in the land of change. So. Here is when you open up a, um, a chain box from SRAM, here is your instructions. Basically a, bun a little booklet in a bunch of languages that tell you to go to the internet should you need to look up some support and information on how to install your chain. Here is Shimano's, very similar. They give you some basic instructions, mostly though, if you're unsure, go to the internet. Campagnolo, in every single chain you get a 123 page book you know it's it's as far as I think I'm long-winded I mean I know it's in a lot of languages but bugger me like 123 page book in every chain um, 
you know, what does that cost them per year, aside from just the, the waste? Uh, and bear in mind how many of these are going to, uh, you know, mechanics um, that really don't need a 123 page uh, book. Like it's, it's maddening stuff. Uh, Camp Agnolo, the internet exists. I know that you know this because you have a website. So, you know, it is time to maybe move some stuff to the internet. Put a little a little pamphlet uh, book in there that's that's bugger all. It's money you can put back into some uh, into some R and D, uh, and I guess spooling up to uh, p put out some 54, uh, 38 chain set combinations for your wonderful new group set. That would be a great move, uh, and you're going to need to do so if you ever want to get your group set into a world tour team anyway. Alrighty. Sorry, my mouse does not work. My computer does not. Alrighty, that'll do. Sorry, jumped around all over the place a little bit there and uh, don't have time to do any uh, takes. Uh, one take one of this afternoon as I try to pump this out. So yeah, I um, hope you found that, um, I guess, a couple of interesting uh, extra points or takes on those uh, two little topics there that uh, may not have sort of been prevalent in some other media that you've uh, listened to or read. Uh, if you enjoyed, I'm supposed to remind you, obviously, to like and subscribe the vids and share them with your friends if you can, uh, so that we uh, yeah keep working our way up. Uh, we're getting close to 10,000, which, again, for a strange, boring old man talking about uh, chain lubrication, um, uh, I'm happy with that. Thank you, everybody. So see if we can get past 10,000 soon. And... Yeah, overall, uh, have a great weekend and I will try to get uh, the next update out on the next low friction topic, um, hopefully next Friday if I can. All right, thanks everyone, bye.